Right before we jump into this video, have you downloaded my app called My Gear Vault? Well, if you haven't, it's the best way to input, organize, and protect your gear, and it's absolutely free for iOS and Android. So now, let's get into the video. Jared Polinfronos Photo. Dot com and this is a real world review of the Nikon Z7. Now I went and photographed my friend Maddie Noyes who was opening up for a musician at the TLA in Philly. She is the perfect subject for us to have for this review because we can get portraits and we can get low light photos at a concert venue. So let's see how the Z7 did. The first thing that I ended up shooting was Maddie getting ready for us to do portraits outside. But we were upstairs in a small dressing room with a little bit of light coming in from outside and some really harsh CFLs over in the corner. Because the room was so small, I decided to start with a 14 to 24. Now the one thing that I needed to be careful about was not getting myself in the reflection in the mirror, though I did get a good picture of myself smiling because I like to have mirror photos of me with the artist, but I also had to make sure that I didn't get Steven or any other distracting things in the background of the images. Throughout this entire review, you will notice an Atomos Ninja Star on top of my Nikon Z7. Now, the reason we have that connected is so that you can see my electronic viewfinder. You see everything that I see. You see the focusing points, you see the settings, and it's a great tool to help you guys learn from what I'm doing. Being that this is Nikon's first full-frame mirrorless camera, they went with an all-new larger mount. They're calling it the Z mount, which means if you'd like to take all of your other Nikon glass that is F mount and put it on this camera, you're going to need an adapter. Now Nikon says that your lenses will adapt seamlessly and 90 of them will still have all of their functionality, but overall 360 will still adapt and work on this mount. The diameter of the Z mount is much larger than what the F mount was. Because of that, Nikon is saying that they can build faster glass to put on the Z mount than they could have ever put on an F mount. But at launch, they only had two new lenses ready to go, a 35 1.8, as well as a 24 to 70 F4. Now those two lenses don't exactly take advantage of the larger mount, but as part of Nikon's roadmap in the next three, four, and five years, you will start to see bigger aperture lenses. Now I don't like the feel of these lenses in terms of quality. The 35.18 feels pretty good. It's not that bad. But I would have expected to see a 1.4 or a 1.2 right off the rip because of the new Z mount and how large it is. The 24 to 70 F4 is super light. That's one of the best things it has going for it is how light it is. But it doesn't feel like the quality that you're finding in the new EOS R line. The RF lenses that Canon has come out with, the 24 to 105 F4, as well as a 50 millimeter 1.2. So Canon got their launch lenses right more so than Nikon. One of the concerns that I had with this camera is how was the autofocus going to be in low light? Now, based off of the images that I got in that small dressing room and focusing in on the mirror, as well as switching to the 35 1.8 S lens, the focus nailed just about every single time. It just felt like I was using a Nikon and not that I was using a new mirrorless camera. Now, I was able to push the ISO a little bit for this because there wasn't that much light in the room and I was somewhere around 2000 ISO. And at least based off of the back of the camera, the images look pretty good. This camera has a brand new Nikon designed 45.7 megapixel BSI CMOS sensor. Now keep in mind, Nikon says this is not the same sensor that is in the Nikon D850. The native ISO of this camera is 64 on the low side and 25,600 on the high side. If you decide to expand it, it's 32 on the low side and 102,400 on the high side. One of the reasons I wanted to shoot at the TLA is because they have a really cool alleyway. The first thing that I shot outside was Maddie against this wall because the wall had some nice tones and colors and reflections and glass. It was a really cool wall that makes for some nice portraits. So I started with the 70 to 200 and did some slightly wider shots before moving in to get some really nice tight headshots. On top of this camera, you will find a new OLED dot matrix panel. Now, one of the issues there is that you can't map out and change the information that is in that display. 
But in all honesty, I don't look at the top of the camera anymore. I can look inside the camera and see all my menu settings much quicker than taking my eye down and looking at that top panel. If weight is a concern for you with your camera, this one weighs in at 1.29 pounds. They also say that it has the same weather sealing as the Nikon D850. Though it is much smaller, it may not feel as substantial to you, but hopefully it is that good. Now, we didn't have a chance to test out that weather sealing because it was beautiful out. One of the things that happens in this alleyway that's pretty cool is that the light comes in and goes through the trees and the leaves and creates some nice streaks. She would tilt her head down so that the light went right through the eye. Now I had no problems with autofocus at all with the 70 to 200 adapted to the camera with VR on and I think it made for some really sharp, colorful and vibrant photos. One of the things I noticed when changing from an F mount lens to a Z mount lens is that the back caps are different. So you can't just pop a back cap off of one and put it onto the other because they have two different types of caps. Is it a deal breaker? No, it's just something you need to remember and be aware of. If you're looking to pick up the Nikon Z7, it's gonna set you back 3,400 bucks for the body only, which is $200 more than the Sony A7R 3 Now, if you already have Nikon glass, you're also gonna need to pick up the FTZ adapter, which is gonna set you back another 150 bucks. Now, many of you guys know that I've been using Nikon for a long time. Now, when I picked up the Z7 for the first time, I was like, how how do I change my focusing modes? I no longer have the button on the left hand side of the camera and Nikon told me, well, we mapped a new button on the right hand side, which is a little more difficult to get to. I personally prefer having it on the side of the camera or I prefer what Canon has done, which is allow you to press one single button that takes you from AF single to AF continuous. Unlike the Canon EOS R, when you change lenses with the Z7, the sensor is fully exposed. The Canon EOS R has the shutter drop down, which is gonna help you not get dust and dirt inside onto the sensor. Now the Nikon Z7 is fully exposed, so you wanna be careful when you're changing lenses that you're not in a wet or a dusty environment and you try to tilt it down when you're changing lenses so you don't get anything inside. Next to the wall that was really busy, there was some ivy. So that was a good place to put Maddie, sit her down and try to get some portraits. One of the things I like about working with Maddie is that she's really good at giving me different poses. She just moves around and then when I see something, I ask her to hold that so that I can capture it. And then she moves on to another pose, which looks pretty good. After shooting the wider shots with the 24 to 70 F4, I wanted to get some tighter headshots with the 105 1.4 adapted to this camera. That is one of my favorite lenses to shoot with when I'm getting portraits. Now the Sony's kick ass with IAF and it makes shooting portraits so much easier. I felt like I was struggling to find the eye with the regular focusing modes that I was using with the Nikon. Now they do give you face detect, but I don't wanna use face detect because I don't know where that's going to focus. Will it be the nose? Will it be the ear? Will it be the eyebrow? I need something like IAF and most cameras out there today have some form of IAF and the Nikon doesn't. There's a new focus mode called Pinpoint Autofocus, which means you can use one of the 493 points and put it right where you want it to try and get focus. Now the caveat is that you need to be an AFS in order to use this. Now Nikon says that this may not be as good as using just a single focusing point. When I switched into it, I noticed how slow it was to focus. It was slower than normal. It was hunting, it was moving. Did I nail the focus? It was actually harder to get focus with this mode than if I was just using single point AF. Moving down the alleyway, I wanted to get some full body portraits. Now one of the things that's great about this mirrorless camera is moving the focusing points 
all the way to the top of the frame so I don't have to focus and recompose or leave a ton of headroom. Were you somebody who liked to use 3D tracking in your older Nikons? Well, you will not find 3D tracking in the Z7. What you will find is something called subject tracking, which is available through Auto Area AF. Now what you need to do is find the subject, hit the OK button, and it's gonna lock on, most likely on the face but you can move it to find a subject, which it's hopefully going to track. I tested this feature out by having Maddie walk towards me and it did an okay job. Now it looked like the autofocusing point was bouncing around quite a bit, trying to track her and she wasn't even moving fast. So I would think if you're trying to shoot fast moving subjects, this isn't going to be the best mode. Being that there was a lot of time to kill before sound check, we took a walk down South Street where we went into a vintage store. Now, now this gave me a great opportunity to capture some photojournalistic candid type photos of Maddie looking through the jewelry. I had her stand in front of the mirror with a 14 to 24 on there and I was able to get some nice shots. Now in the back of the store, I love getting wide angle shots that have a ton of detail. Now the one thing I can say about this situation is that I wasn't fighting the camera. It just felt like I was using a camera like I've always used and it just worked the way I hoped it would. I wanted to cut in here real quick and let you know that we just released 14 custom Lightroom presets. Check out the different looks you can get quickly by using presets like Waffle House, Faded Glory, Black and White Boomify, Sandlot, Kensington, Color Boomify, and more. Head on over to fronosphoto.com slash presets to play with and purchase all 14 of these presets at 40% off for a limited time. Now let's jump back to the video. After leaving the vintage store, it was time to grab some food. Maddie wanted to have a true Philly experience and she wanted a cheese steak and Jim Steaks is right across from the venue. Now Jim Steaks is a really cool place to be and I got some shots of Maddie just ordering her cheese steak with, without, cause that's how you have to say it. And if you order it wrong, they'll probably kick you out. But being that it wasn't busy, I got a couple of cool photos with her looking back at me. Then we went upstairs where we sat near the window to get some photos of her eating. <laughs> One of the great things about shooting with Maddie is that she doesn't mind getting pictures of her eating. Cause I honestly think these photos look really good going from right before eating the sandwich to taking a bite, to chewing, to smiling, laughing and having fun. It makes for a really cool sequence of images. The Nikon Z7 has a brand new autofocus system with 493 phase detect autofocusing points that cover 90% of the frame. Now, why is that important? Because with a DSLR, the focus points are more clumped in the middle. And if you need to reach the outside, you have to focus, then recompose, and with the Z7, you pretty much don't need to do that. One of the features I used a lot is the new customizable eye menu. Now that means when you hit the eye button on the back of the camera, 12 boxes pop up on the screen that you can set 31 different features to. Now this is similar to what Sony lets you do in their camera, but what's different is that with the Nikon, when you're in photo mode, you can have 12 different squares. And when you're in video mode, you can have 12 other squares. Now personally in photo mode for me, I had, uh, let's see, eight of those squares filled with the same things. After leaving Jim's Steak, we came upon another vintage store where there was this cool sofa looking thing sitting out front. Now I had Maddie sit down there. I took some photos with the 24 to 70 again because I wanna keep testing out that S lens. As many of you may know, there is only one card slot in this camera. Nikon, for whatever reason, decided one was enough. Now they went with an XQD card, which I absolutely love because it's super fast, but they should have had two card slots in this camera because I personally love shooting redundant. Raw files to one, 
raw files to the second one just in case there's that one in a million chance where one of the cards fails. Now the camera will be compatible with a future firmware update to allow you to use CF Express cards, but that doesn't make up for the fact that this camera only has one card slot. If you're looking for two, you're gonna have to go look over at Sony. I decided to switch over to the 2.8 VR, sit down next to Maddie and have her play around with those glasses. I wanted to get tight focus right on her eyes as the glasses were lower on the bridge of her nose because I wanted more depth of field. The focus nailed it each time that I captured these images. I had nice blur of the background, the eye was nice and tack sharp, and again, I wasn't fighting the camera. It just felt like any other Nikon that I was shooting. It just felt familiar in my hands. There's a nice large grip for your hand, so even if you have large hands, it's going to feel good in your hands. Also, the rubber doesn't feel slippery like the Sony's. The Sony ergonomics just do not feel good, where Nikon got it right on the first go around because it feels great in the hands. But I will say that the Canon EOS R feels really good, and I think Canon did a better job than what Nikon has done. Now, Nikon has announced that they will be having a grip but it's a battery grip. At this point, we don't know whether or not they're gonna have a vertical grip, which will have a shutter button and all the command dials and focus point movers to allow you to use that on the Z7. We don't know even if this camera is compatible to do so because there's no contacts on the bottom. On the way back to the venue, Maddie got a phone call right outside and she was standing in the most perfect place to get some environmental portraits. She was near the marquee that had her name on it. So this was a great opportunity to use the 24 to 70 2.8 to get some nice vertical shots. The joystick on this camera is in the perfect spot when you're shooting horizontal. When you go vertical, it's much more difficult to reach it and move it. Because this Z7 doesn't have a grip, it was a little more awkward trying to shoot vertically. Now it's also very slow to move those focusing points. Nikon gives you the ability to set the camera so you can skip every other focusing point, but that doesn't make up for the fact that it's super slow to move them. If I had the functionality to slide my finger across the LCD, it would be much better. So let's hope they add that in the future. Then I decided to switch over to the 30 35 1.8 S lens to get closer to Maddie so I could get my focus tight on her and have the marquee out of focus. And those photos turned out really well. The lens felt good in the hands. It's nice and light, but keep in mind it's a 1.8. It's not a 1.4 or a 1.2. This camera has a 2.1 million dot, 3.2 inch tilting touchscreen. Now it is tilting, but it doesn't tilt all the way, which some people may have an issue with. But personally, I leave it on the back of the camera, flush to the back of the camera for just about all of my shooting. If you're somebody who likes to vlog, you probably will be looking at a different camera that has a very angle screen that you can twist and turn out so that you can hold it out like this to see yourself when you're vlogging. Now it was time to test out the camera in a low light situation of sound check. Now sound check ended up being abbreviated because Maddie was pretty much on vocal rest and only ended up doing a half a song. Now I started to shoot those photos with a wider lens because I wanted to show the background of the TLA with her on the stage, especially that the TLA was empty. One of the things you may notice during sound check is that there weren't a lot of lights, so I had to bump the ISO just a little bit. I also was curious to see how the autofocus would would work and it didn't feel like I was having any issues at all. Again, it felt like any other Nikon that I was shooting, I would put the focus point where I wanted to be, I would lock in, I would shoot, and I'd be happy with the results. One of the things that sucks about shooting this camera in low light is if you need to see the buttons, there's no backlit illuminated buttons like you would find on the Nikon D850. This is the first Nikon camera to have built-in 
image stabilization, which they're calling VR. Now it does work really well because we pushed it using a 70 to 200 all the way out at 200 at one tenth of a second and everything was still in focus. VR lenses that you currently have will pair well with this camera with the adapter. Now one thing I noticed is when you turn VR off on the lens, it turns it off on the camera. I didn't see a way that you could turn it on on the camera but leave it off on the lens. After sound check, we went back upstairs to the dressing room. And what was different now is that it was nighttime. So there was no more light coming in from outside. And I was just using what was in the dressing room. Now I shot wider because I got some really cool angles of Maddie in the mirror. I love trying to get unique shots that involve a mirror or reflections. And in this case, it seemed like a double mirror. So if I moved to the side, I could get Maddie in the one reflection and also have her in the second reflection. And they actually look really sharp. That's not always the case when you're shooting into a mirror. Let me interrupt real quick and say that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own website, there's no better thing to use than Squarespace. It's what I personally use for jaredpoland.com. To get your 14 day free trial, go to squarespace.com slash photo. And if you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your order. Now let's get back to the video. This camera shoots full frame 4K at up to 30 frames a second, but with pixel binning. If you're wondering how the video from this camera looks, well, you're looking at it right now. We are shooting with the Z7 with an 85 1.4 adapted in 4K. If you'd like to get full pixel readout, you'll need to shoot in DX crop mode, which is super 35, which is exactly what we're shooting in right now. Also, if you're shooting DX video mode, you can use DX lenses and not get any vignetting. With an external recorder, you will be able to film full frame 4K video at 10 bit 422. This will allow you to record up to 12 stops of dynamic range when you use Nikon's new format, N-Log. Now this video is being shot using N-Log. Now keep in mind there is a slight crop when you shoot in N-Log externally, but this is what it looks like color corrected. In 1080p, this camera will allow you to shoot at 120 frames a second, giving you five times slow motion. Now there is a caveat. When you're shooting slow motion, it will crop down the sensor to super 35, whereas the Sony is using the full frame to give you slow motion. A nice video feature with this camera is that you can bake in the 120 frame a second slow motion, or you could get it with sound at full speed. I'm Conor McGregor. Conor. One of the reasons that most people never use Nikon for shooting video is that the autofocus flat out sucked. Well, in the Nikon Z7, it is much better. It will lock onto faces, it will lock on and track a subject, and in our tests, it's done a really good job. This is definitely a great start, and Nikon is on the right path. After photographing in the dressing room, the doors were now open and it was time to get ready for the show. The first thing I noticed when Maddie walked onto the stage was how bad the lighting actually was. This tends to be the case when it's an opening act. They usually don't ramp up the lights until the headliner comes on the stage, but because of this, I had to bump the ISO up to 4000. Also, they were using LED lights, which are super harsh and give really saturated colors in the face area when you're shooting. 
One of the perks of a mirrorless camera is having the ability to shoot silent. Now you can do eight frames a second silent with this camera. If you are in a place where you need to use silent mode, you can do that in this camera. But keep in mind, you may get some banding depending on the light situations you're shooting in. Because when I was shooting at the concert, they're using LED lights and you can see the stripes that you're getting. Now also, you top out at 1 8,000th of a second, whereas some other mirrorless cameras will allow you to shoot all the way up to 1 32,000th of a second. If you're interested in checking out Music by Maddie Noise, go ahead and do a search on Spotify or click the link down below. I had free reign to move anywhere I needed to go, which gave me a good opportunity to switch through a bunch of different lenses. Now I started off with a 14 to 24 to get those wider shots. Now the lighting was not very good, like I said, which makes it more difficult. And you might question whether or not the autofocus of the Z7 could keep up. And I'm happy to say that it did keep up with the images. Even with not a lot of light coming into the front, I was able to nail focus time and time again. After using the 14 to 24, I switched to the 70 to 200 to try and get tighter shots. Now again, you can see how bad the lights were. Nikon has put a 3.6 million dot electronic viewfinder into this camera. Now, one of the things that you might notice if you've only used a Sony mirrorless camera is that the Nikon sticks out much further. So your nose isn't going straight into the LCD as much as it does with the Sony. In my experience using it, it's bright, it's sharp, it's crisp. But where I ran into an issue is in low light situations, the electronic viewfinder wasn't very representative of the final exposure. Now I did have it set to zero and I turned off auto brightness, which means I should be seeing exactly what my exposure should look like. Now in the low light situation of shooting the concert, I was off by a stop or more because it wasn't very representative of what I was seeing. I was seeing something brighter, thinking that I was getting the exposure right. Now I hope this is something that Nikon can fix or in low light situations, I may just need to lower the brightness of the EVF. Now let's talk about how many frames a second you can get with the mechanical shutter. This camera will shoot nine frames a second in 12 bit compressed raw. But when you do that, it comes at a price because you will lose certain autofocus capabilities. What I like to shoot in is the regular high mode, which gives me five and a half frames a second at 14 bit uncompressed raw. I shot some sports at five and a half frames a second. Now it didn't feel like I was getting five and a half frames per second when I was shooting because the autofocus still needs to catch up to allow you to shoot those images. So it honestly felt like I was more like three and a half to four frames a second. It really felt slower than I thought it should have been. So how's the buffer in this camera? Well, Nikon says you can get 18 14 bit uncompressed raw files before the camera stops shooting. But honestly, in my real world experience, I never outran the buffer because these XQD cards are super fast. All right, let's get it. For the last song, I wanted to leave the pit and go to the back of the venue to shoot a wider shot with the crowd and Maddie on stage. And as you'll notice, most of these images are black and white because the lights were so harsh. It oversaturates the face. And if you don't go to black and white, the images are pretty much not usable. Now, I also had to bump the ISO to 8000. And to be honest with you, the quality looks perfectly fine. You may not expect that in a camera that has super high megapixels, but in this case, it did do a nice job. Ooh, thank you guys so much. Let me jump in here real quick and say, if you'd like to purchase the Nikon Z7 or any other camera gear, click the link down below, which will take you over to Adorama, who support what we do. And by making purchases there, you're helping us make more content like this. There's a new battery for this camera called the ENEL15B, which allows you to charge it via USB cable into the camera. Now this one is a more matte gray compared to the older ones, which is gray as well as black. But you can still use the older batteries in this camera. You just can't charge them via USB. 
Now, a lot of people want to know, how was the battery life in this camera? Well, I got 622 shots with 14% still left at the end of the day after photographing Maddie. Now, I was doing just stills throughout the day. That wasn't mixing in any video. I was reviewing images. I was walking around with the LCD screen on. And honestly, the battery life was pretty good. But if you're going to get this camera, you should have at least two batteries, if not three. So after a long day of shooting and getting a lot of different situations from bright light to low light to higher ISO, the only way to really determine how this camera did is to take a look at the raw files back at the studio and see how they turned out. Here we are back at the loft getting ready to analyze the images from this real world review. But before we do that, I want to remind you that you can download sample raw files from this camera so that you can analyze them yourself at home to determine whether or not you like it or you don't. Now there's something I need to bring up before we go any further. When we were out on location and I was looking at the previews on the back of the camera, I noticed what I thought was maybe hair on the sensor showing up on those previews but it turns out that it wasn't. Now, when I got back to the studio, I took a look at the back of the screen and realized there was some kind of weird artifacting going on with the JPEG previews. Now, I thought it was just the preview in the camera. The raw files looked perfectly fine, but when I shot a JPEG or converted a raw file to a JPEG, it looked like this. Now look at the screen. You can see what's going on right here in the fingers is kind of some kind of JPEG artifacting going on with the highlights. You can see it more on my face right here where it kind of looks like I'm the ultimate warrior and wearing a mask. Now, now here's the raw file. The raw file is perfectly fine. There's no issues with it at all. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I checked with other people who have the camera and nobody else saw this issue at all. We sent this camera back to Nikon because we let them know what we saw. They sent it to Japan and they sent us another camera to use and we didn't have any issues with that one either. Nikon claims that it was just our camera that was affected by whatever was happening. They said there's no other reports of anybody seeing this. I haven't seen it anywhere else and I talked to a lot of people who have used the camera and they haven't seen it at all. And the only reason I'm bringing it up is because it showed up in our camera. We don't want something coming out six months from now going, this is a major issue. Do I think it's a major issue? No, because nobody else has this problem as of now, and it also doesn't affect the RAW files. If you're Ken Rockwell and you shoot JPEG and you have a camera that ends up having this issue, then there may be a problem there. So this is most likely a software issue versus a hardware issue, which I rather have a software issue because those tend to be able to be fixed with firmware updates. But like I said, we haven't had any issues with the new camera that they sent and haven't heard any other issues from anybody else that has a Z7 at this point. Now that we got that out of the way, I do want to say there were a lot of people talking shit about this camera and people who never used the camera. You got to be really careful talking about cameras that you've either never used or only had your hands on for a couple of minutes. That's not a way to review it. So now let's take a look at these images and talk about how this camera worked out. So here's the first image that I want to talk about and it is really nice done with the 35 millimeter f 1.8 S lens. That's the new lens from Nikon that allows you to, well, not have an adapter. Uh, the colors look good. The sharpness edge to edge is great. I was very happy with being able to hit the focus where I needed focus to go. This is one of those images where I don't think a DSLR's focusing point on any camera would have been able to stretch out to the side of the frame and get this shot. But I do want to say that the 3518 still feels a little plasticky, a little cheap, even though it's 850 bucks. It's a good lens, it's sharp, it's got the edge-to-edge -edge sharpness that they're talking about with their S-line lenses, but for 850 bucks, you might wanna think about looking at the Sigma 35 1.4 art lens, which is 899 bucks, or the Nikon 35 1.8 for the full frame is like 520 bucks, and you could just adapt that lens without a problem. So moving on to the next shot, this is just one that I did with a 105 1.4 to give you a portrait, where at 320 ISO, and the sharpness, what's interesting is when you look at her eyeball right here, it's like the focus focused really tightly on 
the background, the trees in the background. It's so darn sharp that it nailed that. You could also see that it's kind of sharp around the bottom eyelid, but I just wanted to share this image with you guys to, so you could see a portrait at 1.4 to see how well it did or see how well it didn't do. You can determine that yourself. I like the colors, I like the tones, I like the clarity. And then moving on to a 24 to 72.8 VR, I mean, this one is super sharp. We're at 125 ISO. This is really nice. Focused right on the eye, right where I needed it to be. I didn't have a problem moving the focusing points. Now, like I said earlier, using the joystick to move the focusing points is kind of a little slow. They do need to get to the point where you can move your thumb across the screen. That would make focusing much easier or honestly go to IAF, but I love how this image looks. I really like the quality of it. Uh, the other problem was shooting vertical. I didn't have a grip, which means, well, I didn't have a button up here and I had to put my hand all the way over the top. Moving on, just another street portrait I wanted to share. Love how sharp it is right on the eye, right where I needed it to be. Move the focusing point, nailed it. No IAF again, but didn't have a problem getting the shot that I wanted. Nice blown out bokeh on the side. Really cool file to check out. Now this is an interesting one. Let me move over to the develop module real quick because this is edited. Now I'm off by almost three stops. And let me explain, well actually, let's see what it looked like. This is what the shot looked like straight out of the camera raw file. This is what it looks like processed and it holds up really well even at 1250 ISO, which honestly isn't that far. But when you're off by three stops, I probably should have been somewhere around 8,000 ISO to get the shot where it is right now. Why was I off in this shot? Well, the EVF, the EVF gave me a different look inside the camera than what was actually going to be the final exposure. It looked brighter to me, and that's why I dropped the ISO to get the shot. So this is something you might wanna be careful about in the Z7, is that knowing that the EVF may be a little brighter than what you're actually getting in your final image. But being off three stops, it still held up really well. Moving on to the next shot, I just love how sharp this is even in a mirror. Usually reflection shots aren't super sharp and part of that is the mirror that you're shooting into, but it nailed the focus perfectly here. Now this again is another shot where I don't think any DSLR that I have, even my D5, I wouldn't be able to move a focusing point to her eye to get it where I needed it to be. This is where having all of the focusing points being able to spread out across the frame comes in handy. Sure, it's still slow to move, and this is where Sony beats Nikon, because IAF would mean I don't have to worry about moving the focusing points myself. I hit a button, and it just nails the eye exactly where I need it, basically every time. Moving on to the next image, we have a high ISO shot. This one is done at 8,000 ISO. Let me show you where this started. This is where it started. Really low, bad, terrible LED lights. Obviously it doesn't work in color because look at her face. The lights do that when you're shooting with LEDs. They kind of wash out the face. But so we go like this, this is my editing, and I think this is a great shot even at 8000 ISO. The grain, the noise, just looks like grain should look like. It doesn't detract, in my opinion, from the shot. But what I do have to tell you is that with the Z7, when you are bringing in a RAW file into Lightroom, it's maintaining your picture styles even in the raw file. So what's happening is if I put my camera on vivid for the picture style and upped my sharpness and I brought that raw file into Lightroom, those changes are gonna show up as soon as I import it, including baking in lens correction, and I don't even think I can turn the lens correction off even though I have it off in the camera. Let me show you quickly what I'm talking about. I'm gonna go ahead and hit reset here, and I had a basic, basic picture style on in the camera. You can see that contrast is at plus 20. You can see that saturation is at negative six. And you can see down here at sharpness, it's at 36, which normally it defaults to 40 when you bring things into Lightroom. I don't like the fact that it does this. Nikon is the first camera with a Z7 to work with Adobe, I'm pretty sure, to bake in the raw file information and then allow you to use that right off the rip in Lightroom. I would prefer that we turn this option off if we have the ability to do that because right now I have to import the files 
with a preset that has everything set to zero. So that's just something you need to be aware of when you pick up a camera like this. So moving on to the next part, we've got some sports images. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because people are like, this is not a sports camera because it's 40 some megapixels. It's really not meant for that. Well, honestly, any camera is meant for whatever you decide to use it for. Ideally, you wouldn't be using such a high megapixel camera to do such a thing. But I took it out to a soccer game and I want to run through 15 shots in a row that I did of this guy right here. I have the focusing point using dynamic area AF right on his chest because that's the easiest place to put it. I'm not happy that Nikon doesn't have all of the dynamic area AF modes that they have in their DSLRs. You've got nine, you've got 21, you've got or 25, whatever they are, all the way up to 151 dynamic area AF. Here they just have nine. It's a big ass box that's a hell of a lot bigger than when you're using a DSLR. They also took out 3D tracking, which some people like to use 3D tracking. I personally didn't like using it for action, but if that's what you were looking for, it doesn't have it in this camera. But I went through, it missed this shot because it transitioned over to this guy's leg right here, but then it picked him up in the next shot uh, after that, and I'm using a 300 f4 here. That's why my composition, you know, he's leaving the frame just a little bit. And then boom, we nail it on the last picture right here. So it did a very good job with the action using just the five frames a second shooting raw. I was pretty happy with the results I ended up getting there. Now, when I went out and shot, at first, I thought I wasn't getting great results. I thought the autofocus wasn't doing a good job. When I got him back home, it did a pretty good job. It didn't do the greatest job since sliced bread, but a lot of the shots were focused that I thought weren't gonna be focused. So I was pretty happy with those results. And then I took shots at a baseball game. You got this kid right here. This one is shot at 100 ISO using the 300 F4. Super duper sharp right on his face. You can download this file and play with this one as well. And then to even test out the focus again, I got the kid running did eight frames in a row of him running. We're at base ISO of 64 here, and it nailed it. Time and time again, just running down the bases. Nailed him going from second to third. Every shot is exactly where it needs to be. And so this camera, if you need to use it for sports, is perfectly fine using it for sports. And after shooting multiple things from sports to shooting Maddie all day at the concerts, I have to say, I didn't really miss focus. Throughout that day with Maddie, I shot 600 and some photos, and I didn't really miss. Occasionally you have those ones where you're like, oops, I missed it or I did some human error type thing, but that was few and far between and it just kept hitting every time I needed it to hit. So here's the thing, I didn't miss shots that a DSLR otherwise would have been able to capture. I actually think I was able to get shots that a DSLR wasn't able to capture. So that's something to keep in mind is that this can get shots that you may not have been able to get with a DSLR. Next up, let's talk about adapted lenses, especially versus Canon. The adapted lenses worked well. The focusing was fast. It could have been faster. See, I say that because the Canon feels like lightning when you're adapting those Canon lenses to the EOS R. That just feels like lightning. So the Canon autofocus just seems much faster when it comes to having the adapted lenses compared to Nikon. But again, the Nikon didn't hold me back. And if you have a lot of AFS lenses, the newer glass, and you have the adapter, I don't think you're gonna have a problem at all. Now the native lens lenses on the Nikon side did feel slightly faster, and I do suspect that when they come out with the trinity of lenses and the better glass, well, those lenses will focus really well as well. Now, the big question for me is do I want the next DSLR that comes out? If they don't come out with a, a, a D5S and they come out with a D6, do I want that? It's a really tough decision because there's so many features in a mirrorless camera that I love that I don't have in a DSLR. Being able to move the focusing points all the way out to the edges is really important to me. But not having two card slots, not having a vertical grip is something that is also important to me. So I'm gonna have to make a decision when that next camera comes out. But a lot of people wanna know D850 versus Z7. This is an interesting one because it's basically the same image quality from one camera to the other. With the D850, it's a little bigger. It can shoot faster because you can put a vertical grip on it and get nine frames a second with the D5 battery. It also has dual card slots, but the Z7 focusing points go all the way to the edges. 
it can shoot silent, it has in-body stabilization. And if you shoot video and you're trying to decide what you should get, well, if you do shoot video at all, you kind of might want to just go with the Z7 because you have continuous autofocus in video, you can shoot through the EVF. It's honestly a much better option when it comes to shooting video to go with the Z7 versus the D850. Now to put it up against the Sony a7R 3 is more of a challenge. The a7R 3 is already a year old, but it's still a fantastic camera. You've got your IAF, you've got better silent shooting. It's a really fantastic camera. The question you have to ask though, do you have a lot of Nikon glass? If you're heavily invested in the Nikon glass, I see no reason to jump ship. But where Nikon needs to be worried is the fact that when every new person coming up to shoot today, whether they're kids or they just wanna get their first professional type camera, they're all looking Sony because Sony has done a fantastic job marketing and giving people what they want. At the end of the day, it's a really bright future for Nikon. The Z7 is a fantastic first go of it. It's not perfect. It's not the greatest camera ever, but it has some features that are really good and the image quality is great. And the recurring theme for me throughout my time shooting with it is that I didn't feel like I was missing shots that I otherwise would have had with the DSLR. I didn't miss having the DSLR. In fact, I loved having the features that I had in the Z7 for the mirrorless technology. So I think it's a great go of it. Nikon did a very nice job here. It will get better. It can get better. It has to get even better. But if you've been waiting to replace your DSLR, this is a DSLR killer in my opinion. I think it's time for the DSLR to go away. A company like Nikon or Canon needs to do what Apple did, kill the DSLR, focus heavily on mirrorless just like Sony did, and maybe they can win the market. So don't forget that you can download these sample raw files over on the website. Let me know what you think. Leave comments down below. Like, share, subscribe. And don't forget, we do offer 14 custom presets. You can go over to fronosphoto.com slash presets to play with all 14 of them right now to see if you'd like to purchase them because they are on sale. So that's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. Jared Poland, fronosphoto.com. See ya.